Hi there everyone, my name is Christian Eschbach and welcome to another one of my album reviews. If you're one of my regular viewers, then you should know that this review is going to be a Beatles review. And I just spoiled it by accidentally holding up the album. That's right, we're going to talk about Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Oh, great album. Honestly, okay, so this is when this is when things really start getting interesting with the Beatles, okay? Um, oh, all right, I'm just going to get into this right off the bat. So this is one of the digitally remastered ones. I've already discussed, uh, when I did Rubber Soul, which was my last video I did there, I discussed the digital remasters and the redos, some of the artwork there. Okay. Um. The sound quality on the remaster is absolutely fantastic. And I have always said that this album, interestingly, had very early but not quite their metal-esque elements to it. And you can hear them right away on the first track, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band. Now, everybody's going to be like, there's no metal in there. You're right, there isn't. But listen to how heavy, if you, especially on this copy, all right? If you listen to how heavy it is, and if you hear other renditions of it where they play it similar, just in the other band's kind of own styling one, it's always really kind of heavy. So it's not that they're, it's metal. It's the heavy side of it. If you're one of my regular viewers, you know how I feel about that whole discussion between heavy and metal. But anyways, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is one of probably my definitely top 10 Beatles songs, possibly top 5. Absolutely love this song. I love how heavy it is. I know it's a bit cliche and most people would be like, well, that's a pretty commercial song. It's commercial mostly because just the length of the song. It's really not a long song. And I, it clocks in at less than three minutes. I think it's barely over two. Um, I'm sure I can pop up the time on the screen here. And I just really love how it gets into it. But I love how it's basically this great introduction piece to this whole album. Like, it gives you the story. It sets it up. Like, this is kind of an... It's a concept album, but it's not a concept album. You know, it's the Beatles releasing an album, but not really the Beatles. It's... It's very, it's clever and it's interesting and musically it's very experimental. And I love how it goes from something so heavy or what I'd say as early heavy as Sgt. Pepper's and goes into With a Little Help from My Friends. Now, I dig the version that is on this album. I love what the Beatles did with it. I always view what the Beatles did with it as a blueprint. Because, honestly, I love probably every version I've heard covered <laughs> with a little help from my friends more than I like the Beatles version. And it's not that I don't like the Beatles version. I think the Beatles version is awesome. I just like what other people do with it, how they'll give it a little more of a rock edge or, you know, they'll give it, you know, they'll just give it little tweaks, little edges, you know, like Joe Cocker, for example, you know, like who doesn't love his version? You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, with a little help from my friends, man. Great tune, though. Honestly, I just, the trumpet work in there and stuff like that. It's really cool. Um, I just like it a little more rocked out, a little less produced. And as much as I love how produced this album is, because it's a great example of artistic production and what they could do back in the day, it's also a shining example of, in some cases, overproduction. All right, after with a little help from my friends, we get into Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. We all know the controversy over Lucy and the Sky of the Diamonds. And I don't give a shit. It's a fun song. I love what most people would consider the nonsensical lyrics. I think it's 
honest and it's beautiful and it's freeing and it's just a poetic soul getting released, you know, and things don't always have to be perfectly making sense. And it can just be this abstract visual imagery that floods through your mind. And because you have this great music that sets it on this dreamscape like flow, you just, you can't, uh, you can't help but not enjoy the song. Unless you don't like the Beatles. Alright. Uh, getting better. I love getting better. Getting better is a really cool and interesting song on this album. And I think one of the reasons I enjoy it so much, I think one of the reasons I find it so interesting on this album is it's basically John Lennon doing a giant public apology for all of his piss poor behavior and how he's working on himself as a human being to get better. How he's trying to be a better human being. It's something I think that what, why should we all strive to? Why should we not all strive to be better human beings? To get better, you know? To examine our faults. We don't necessarily have to go so public about it. But he's a musician. You know, that that's kind of how that works, right? Everybody goes, oh, you're a poet. You're a heart to yourself. So anyways, but to examine what a jackass you were and to try and be a better person for it, you know? Um, and to go with this, you know, like the person I am with Tracy is not the person I was with my ex who I was with for 15 years. Tracy is not a person who I think got better, you know, who's a much better person. I Tracy says the same thing. She says the way that she was with her ex and the way that she is with me, she's changed as well. She's not the same person. She's gotten better from who she was. People grow. People change. And that's why I love the song, Getting Better. After that, we go into Fixing a Hole. Coincidentally, <laughs> sometimes that's why you leave a relationship is you got to fix a hole. <laughs> Um, Fixing a Hole is a cool little tune. Um, I enjoy listening to it when the album is playing. It's one of those songs that's really fun when the album is playing, but it's not a song that I go out of my way to listen to on the album. Uh, then we get to She's Leaving Home. That's not a bad tune. Um, it, I'm kind of impartial-ish to she's leaving home. It's it's okay, but I really just, you know. Uh, after that, we get into being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. Okay, um, I've got mixed feelings about this song. It's one of those songs that I both love and for its artistic sentiments, but don't really enjoy at the same time for the exact same reason. I really love the experimentation on it. I really like what they do with it. I really like how they play it out. I really love the showmanship of it. I really like how you can definitely feel that ring presence. You know, that three ring circus presence. But at the same time, that's the same reason why I don't like it. Like, I don't mind circus style theatrical music when I'm at the circus to add the dynamics to the circus. And for what they were doing for this piece, it works brilliantly. Just not what I really want to listen to when I'm listening to this album in particular. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't augment or change the flow of the album. And if I was listening to it on vinyl, where I had to get up and flip it, and I believe this is actually the first track on side two, it's great that way. Listening to it on the CD, where you're going through all the tracks consecutively. Alright, so we get to 
within you, without you. Um, I I know that this is a George Harrison song, but I'm not. This is one of those ones where it kind of flies under my radar a little bit. Like it's not a bad tune, but it's just kind of a. It's one of those tracks that's on the album kind of thing for me. Uh, when I'm 64, okay. Uh, Yes, it's a cute, fun song. It's not the song I want to hear on a Beatles album per se. That that's that that's one of those ones where you know it's too popsy, it's too cutesy, it's too just not what I want to hear from the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. That's 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 where I'm going with that. Uh, Lovely Rita, I love Lovely Rita. Lovely Rita, you know, I don't think of it on its own, but when I'm listening to the actual song, I like the music on it. I like the arrangements on it. I like the whole way that it's kind of put together. It's not a bad tune on its own, you know. It is, Lovely Rita, 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 you know. I just great tune, great tune, just fun. Uh, ooh, good morning, good morning. That one, once again, both like it and dislike it for the same reason. I like the experimentation on it with it musically. I love the way that they play, good morning, good morning, good morning, ooh, and then, you know, they throw in the sound effects and stuff like that. I like how they were starting to get into playing with stuff like that. It was really cool, and I like what they were going for. Because this is something that was not being done really yet in music. This is something that was just kind of getting into and stuff like that. Like, this is the early days of sampling, you know. This is something we take for granted now, you know, when you, especially, you know, those of us that listen to, like, the likes of, say, Rob Zombie or Marilyn Manson, where you always hear sampling in there, right? This is not quite the same as that, but this would be the early days of that. This is what led to that, essentially. And this is one of those examples where it's not done in a way that I'm overly fond of, but it's not bad. You know, it's not horrible. Then we get to the Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club Band Reprise. Great way to take it in and finish out the whole kind of th theme in there. I like the rocky kind of vibe to it. The upbeat was such a bad And they just kind of get a little more raw, a little more rocky compared to the original on it. It's... I think the reprise, when you hear about the Jimi Hendrix cover of it and the way that Jimi Hendrix does his cover, I think he was inspired more by the reprise than he was even the original because it's got more of that rocky edge to it. And I think it's cool for that reason. And then the last track, track 13, A Day in Life. A Day in the Life is... You remember all those things I was just saying about Good Morning, Good Morning, where I'm not a huge fan of the sampling and the kind of the production and stuff like that, where they don't do it right? Well, A Day in the Life is an example of them doing it perfectly. Uh, the composition on A Day in the Life, I think, is... I mean, no one's going to say it's an underrated Beatles song because anybody who is a real Beatles fan... I mean, I both sides of the spectrum, whether you're original Beatles, classic Beatles, or you're whole way around, most people really tend to dig A Day in the Life. You know, it's just quite the song, quite the story, right? And... I think closing this album out with A Day in Life is beautiful. I think it is perfect. I don't think you could ask for a better way to close this album out. It is also probably my favorite song on this album. I mean, I really love Sgt. Pepper's, but A Day in the Life, whew, that is something spectacular. And as a music fan, as a student of music, self-taught student of music, but still a student of music, it is... 
one of those songs that should be and, and as someone who's not even just as that i mean when it comes to i don't talk about it too much when i do the reviews but when it comes to my band the howling odyssey all the recordings we ever did all the production on it that was always my call i was always the one that engineered the uh, the recordings engineered produced i that was my job I, that's what i did because I had the most background, the most knowledge on it, and I was the most interested in it, and I had been for years, so I took the time and effort to learn a lot of that. I'm not saying I'm great at it, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but a song like A Day in the Life really inspired the songs production-wise for me, the way that I did them and layered them and put them together and stuff like that. I never did major production like that. I always prefer recording with the band as a whole and then, you know, playing with it afterwards and stuff. Anyways, that's for a Confessions of a Domestic Engineer. I'll get into that one day. But uh, that, that's what I'm trying to say, though, is A Day in the Life is that good of a song the whole way around. Like, whether you're looking at it as a musician, you're looking at it as a storyteller, you're looking at it as a producer, an engineer. It, it's that amazing of a song that it should be required for everybody to learn, as far as I'm concerned. Not that you have to learn how to play it, but you should really learn the song, you should really listen to the song, you should really get to know the song. Doesn't mean, you, you know, and then you study the individual facets as it applies to your tastes and needs. <laughs> Not everybody needs to know the production side of it. <laughs> Not everybody needs to know the music side of it. Although that's cool too. <laughs> Anyways, folks, uh, that's my view on Sgt. Pepper. Uh, we're not going to get into the people on the cover and we're not going to get into the hidden messages down in here and stuff like that. No. Paul is dead. Anyways, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Leave me your comments. Let me know what you think. Uh, <laughs> hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Otherwise, peace, love, and take care.